Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Bus Expo China Summit. In this session, Alexander Gloss will talk to you. You might have seen his last session on Monday, where he told you all about WeChat. Today, he will talk about bubbles. Alexander, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for that、uh, gracious introduction, and I'm pleased to welcome everybody to our most recent video webinar from the China I2I Group. Today we're going to talk about travel bubbles and how they are evolving and dominating the travel marketplace in China, and how this may become the future of travel around the world. My name is Alexander Gloss. I'm the CEO at the China Eye to Eye Group, based in Shanghai. We've been in China since 1999, and I have lived in China for the past 16 years.、Uh, we have three offices in China: in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, with 27 professionals offering international quality marketing, promotion, business development, social media, publishing. Exhibitions, conferences, roadshows, and more to our over 300 annual clients. So let's get started today with talking about how China has been managing and containing the COVID crisis since the start back in January. And even though today living in China is extremely normal. You know, restaurants, shopping centers are all open. Movie theaters are open. Even Shanghai Disneyland is open. The only place you really get a sense that the crisis is still happening is when you board public transportation and you have to wear a mask. But a large part of China is totally recovered from the crisis that happened earlier this year. And China has been very aggressive in containing the crisis. By implementing procedures and steps that might be looked upon internationally as draconian, but from the Chinese perspective, have actually been welcome and very effective. China initially implemented a series of regional, city, and provincial lockdowns, essentially prohibiting any movement of peoples and goods. In and out of areas where infections were identified and suspected, 14-day national and provincial quarantines were aggressively implemented and monitored by local health officials, police, and in some cases by the national military. China implemented a national testing program, encouraging virtually everybody in the country to be tested, and especially people in high-risk environments. Uh, initially, testing results took several days, but now, if you're tested in China, you typically get the result just in a couple of hours. Of course, travel was completely restricted in most of China earlier this year, and businesses were ordered to close by the national and provincial governments. At the same time, China implemented procedures and policies for for hygiene and monitoring. And testing to be implemented once businesses and travel were allowed to reopen, and much of that system was put into place back in March and April, which allowed businesses to reopen and the start of the travel industry throughout the country. What was very interesting to observe firsthand in China was how cooperative and energetic Chinese people were in this process over these several months. Rather than being hysterical or unwilling to cooperate because of any sense of infringement on individual rights, Chinese people really responded in a very positive way of recognizing that this is a very serious crisis, and that dramatic actions need to be taken, and people need to get it done and just simply do it. Of course, domestic travel in China was greatly impacted during the crisis. The first time I realized that something was developing was reading a media article in China on or about December 30th, 
that indicated there was a bad flu outbreak in Wuhan and that people needed to be very careful. I think it was about a week or so later, in the first several days of January, uh, that some friends and colleagues began to tell me that they were hearing rumors about people getting sick. A couple of friends of mine who work in hospitals and medical centers in China told me that the number of emergency room patients with flu-like symptoms was increasing rapidly and that people were thinking this might be a new SARS epidemic. I really saw it for the first time returning from the FITOR exhibition in Madrid in the middle of January. I remember hopping on the plane back to Shanghai and there were about 20 passengers on an A350. I think there was more crew than passengers. In January and February, domestic travel in China dropped by approximately 90%. This is really exceptional considering Chinese New Year was in January, where typically 500, maybe 600 million Chinese travel back to their hometowns. You know, needless to say, by February, Chinese travel was nearly non-existent because of the lockdowns and the quarantines that were implemented across the country. But by March and April, travel began to rebound slightly as people returned to their working places, predominantly in and around the larger cities. At the same time, airlines and the National Rail Service were selling tickets at 90% discounts from regular prices. By early May, it was clear that the most dangerous time in the crisis had probably passed. In large part, companies had reopened, but there were still restrictions on working conditions. You know, people had to wear masks, wearing gloves, in some cases, total protective wear. But people began to venture out. The streets began to be full. Shopping centers started to reopen. And finally, there was a sense of normality that it might actually return soon. In May and June, you began to see the travel industry re-engage, re actually, with, with businesses and leisure consumers, offering incentives and deals, packages, kind of two-for-one flight deals, still at remarkably discounted prices. At this time, you could basically fly anywhere in China for about 35 euros, maybe 50 euros in total. You know, five-star hotels in big cities and resorts were selling rooms for 75 euros per night, including breakfast, including mini bar, extra massage services, quite a deal. By July of this year, the summer travel season really began to impact domestic Chinese travel. Firstly, schools, which had reopened and extended their schedules, were actually closing in July and August for a shorter summer break. And travel prices, along with incentives and deals, continued to be very strong, although not quite the ridiculously cheap prices we, we saw back in, in May. And resort destinations like Sanya on Hainan Island, uh, Guilin, and other traditional holiday destinations in China suddenly became very attractive to the Chinese leisure traveler. By August and September, some of these resort destinations were reporting nearly sold-out conditions, 90% occupancy on the weekends and 70% occupancy during the weekdays and more importantly, hotel room rates that were about 30% above normal. The Chinese traveler was really back. And for the most recent October National Day holidays in China, by most accounts and early statistics being reported, travel has rebounded to nearly 100% of where it was in 2019. Approximately 500 million travelers took to the roads and the rails and the air in the last two weeks in China. And this clearly indicates that the appetite for Chinese travel and adventure is very much alive and well. So a lot of my clients ask me, how could this happen? How did China's travel rebirth actually occur? 
And in large part, I, I don't think it had anything to do really with the discounting and incentives that were being offered by travel suppliers. After all, who really wants to travel if the prices are great, but if they don't really feel safe doing it? So what happened in China was a model that we think is really the key to reopening global travel from China and other source markets for any destination. The key criteria for Chinese travelers this year has been safety, health, and hygiene. If the traveler does not feel safe, if they don't feel that the travel experience is safe, if they don't see that the travel supplier is engaging in safety, health, and hygiene, they're not going to travel. I've actually seen people refuse to go into a shopping center in China because the shopping center was not taking people's temperatures. So for Chinese, if you're not engaging in health and safety and hygiene systems, then you are not safe and they don't want to walk in the door. In China, this has meant the creation of a series of inspection and control systems designed to find people who could possibly be infected and to prevent the spread of infection. In China, temperature controls exist every time you walk in and out of a building. When you go into the metro, your temperature is monitored. Everybody in China has a health app, which is being issued by the provincial or city governments, which monitors where you have been and the rates your level of risk based on where you have been. So, for example, if you were living in Wuhan in January and February and decided to travel to Shanghai, you would be identified as a high-risk traveler, and many cities and provinces pro prohibited uh, high-risk travelers from entering their, their cities. At the same time, these health apps in China work as a contact tracing system, allowing health officials to trace potential contact with infected people. So, for example, if you had dinner last night in a restaurant and somebody in that restaurant tested positive, the health ministry would be able to contact me, test me, and evaluate my health condition. And this has been exceptionally important in controlling the viral spread and outbreak. In recent weeks, when there have been small outbreaks, uh, in office buildings, for example, the entire office building can be contacted and tested immediately. And everybody in the office building who has had contact with other people can also be immediately tested. Recently, one outbreak in, in Beijing resulted in about 45,000 people being tested in 48 hours. It sounds really impressive, and it is impressive, and it's absolutely necessary to contain the virus. When you travel in China today, not only do you have to show your health app, but very often when you enter a hotel or get on an airplane, a healthcare worker will actually conduct a quick interview looking at your health status, in which they're actually doing a rapid visual examination of your health condition. Finally, testing is available everywhere in China, and it's for free. And in many cases, depending upon the company in which you work or the industry in which you work, like healthcare or policing, fire, travel, such as airlines and hotel, it's actually mandatory to have regular testing. So this results, of course, in a system in place on a national and provincial and even local level that identifies the illness and the spread, is able to control it, quarantine it, and provide immediate health care. The result of this system is that in large part, China has actually become a bubble. The borders are basically closed at the moment except for special travel needs and although domestic travel is back to normal, it's basically one big virus-free bubble. So why is it really necessary to create a bubble? The simple answer is that it's the right thing to do. And in regards to the potential rebound of the travel industry, 
A bubble is the only way to make travel consumers feel really safe and secure. The best example of this that I have recently seen in China has been what is going on in the island of Hainan and Sanya in southeastern China, which is very near to Vietnam. Now, Sanya is a well-known beach destination with many five-star hotel resorts, plenty of water and mountain activities, duty-free shopping. Basically, this is kind of like China's Miami Beach. So when you travel to Sanya, you have to show your health app at check-in at the airport or at the border of the province. That's providing you that you are green and that you are no risk. And at the same time, you have to download and register your information on the local Hainan provincial health app, which is going to be used to monitor you when you're actually on the island. Now, this clears you for departure, and this means that you are safe to go to Sanya. On arrival, they check your app. They check your health conditions. In some cases, they can offer you a quick viral test uh, on arrival, and you actually get a test result in less than one hour. And they have special facilities at the airport to handle all of this. They've also collected information on uh, and about data about where you are staying. For instance, whether you're staying in a hotel, an apartment, at a friend, etc. And so they have an additional system of contact tracing in place. Once you're on the island, in the resort communities, temperatures are taken whenever you enter any of the hotels, whenever you enter a restaurant, a movie theater, a shopping center, etc. And there's a constant sense of health management and monitoring. But at the same time, this provides everybody with a sense of safety and security. Because basically, to get to this point, think about it like this. To get to the swimming pool at the Atlantis Hotel, you have been checked, you've been double-checked, you've been triple-checked, and so it's about as safe as it's ever going to get. The result is, is that your swimming experience at the pool is safe and free, and you don't have to worry about everybody else. Access to the pool is actually not limited. Nobody is wearing masks. So you can go out to dinner, you have a normal evening out, you can go to the movie theater, you can go shopping. It's almost like you have traveled back in time. And suddenly, now you're in the summer of 2019. The magic of the travel bubble is that it is clean, secure, and a verified environment. The bubble is the attraction for the Chinese traveler. Like I described before, where the Chinese shopper does not want to go into the shopping center unless they have the right kind of health and hygiene inspection, the same applies to the travel bubble. It means it is safe. Travelers love this. This is what they're paying for, a great travel experience that is safe and secure because they can act and behave in a normal way, without masks. To be able to have that kind of a travel experience is worth the interruption of the temperature monitoring, of the health apps, etc. And at the same time, travel suppliers use this as marketing sales to the travel consumer, just like they would be marketing and promoting themselves, highlighting their accommodations, food, beverage, entertainment, activities, sports facilities, etc. So destinations that are bubbles in China actually market and promote themselves as safe and hygienic. This is the lead communication from these travel destinations. And the results are that, as we've seen like this summer and during the October National Day holidays, has been that the hotels in China are full and that they're charging premium rates at times where historically they've not actually been able to do that. And we believe that the future of international bubbles is going to be corridors that are set up between different countries that share similar health monitoring and control systems. 
And this is already being developed and implemented on a limited basis from China to certain countries. In most cases, travel is now permitted from China uh, to regional countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia, firstly for business travel and now for uh, some leisure travelers who meet certain health and safety criteria, criteria and also in limited numbers. Now, it's important to mention the perception that Chinese people have of international travel. Now, firstly, Chinese love to travel internationally. And for many domestic Chinese travelers, international travel is the most important aspirational travel that they would like to experience in the near future. When we survey Chinese travelers through our different WeChat systems, international travel remains a top interest and a priority for many Chinese travelers. But the crisis has made it necessary that safety now is the first priority in choosing any kind of travel. And most of our clients ask the same question, what is it going to take to get the Chinese to travel again? And in our opinion, first and foremost, it's going to have to be that borders are open, that it's actually possible for people to travel. However, we think that if the borders were all open today, that would not be sufficient alone to drive international Chinese travel. Vaccinations being readily available is really the game changer. Because once you're vaccinated, you are safe and secure, even if you are theoretically surrounded by people who are infected. You basically become your own bubble once you are vaccinated. China now has two phase three vaccination studies going on. And actually, vaccines are being given, administered to healthcare workers, fire, police, and even some people who work in the travel industry, especially in airlines and hotels. So this process is actually beginning. But what we think is also very important is destination preparation. Having a clean hotel is great, but nobody lives exclusive, exclusively, at least, in a hotel when they travel. So creating a bubble experience like what we've seen in China, we believe is really going to be the ultimate key to opening international travel from China or any other kind of source market. So what is next? You know, we see the bubble model as being imperative in the next year. Islands, mountain destinations, which in many ways actually are islands just in the mountains, small cities, regional areas can most easily implement the bubble system. We've seen this to some extent in the UAE and in Dubai, where they are requiring testing before departure, testing on arrival, but they also provide free health insurance coverage for your stay in Dubai once you get there. Basically, you're free to go wherever you want and to act and behave as you like, of course, within the laws. But the travel bubble is essentially alive and well right now in the UAE and in Dubai. So it's possible to not just do this on an island or on a mountaintop, but if you have a mechanism in place to control your borders, and you have the health system ability to monitor and manage, you can actually easily create a bubble. We believe that the vaccination system will also be critical. It will allow people to resume travel. Just like there are vaccinations for common flu and other types of viral diseases, this will suddenly make it possible for people to feel safe when they travel. But the travel health apps that are available in China will also identify people who have been vaccinated. Now, ongoing diligence, especially when there are limited outbreaks, will continue. You know, in China, we're entering into the, the fall and the autumn, and people are concerned that there might be limited outbreaks. But China has systems in place to both identify and manage outbreaks rapidly and effectively. You know, destinations around the world are going to have to be prepared for that in the coming months. And destinations that can conduct themselves effectively 
in managing viral outbreaks will be rewarded in the near term with opening their markets before others. Finally, I think it's important for organizations, for travel suppliers to understand how radically different the new normal is. Competition is going to be king in the beginning to open up your destination. Just like what we saw back in China in May and June, with destinations and hotels and airlines offering incentives and bonuses and deals. I'm not sure that many European travel suppliers completely understand this yet. You know, recently we were looking for some conferencing space in Germany in the summer of next year. And I was really impressed to find that some of the hotels said that you have to book 400 rooms per night before they would even talk to us. Now, I hope your business is successful next June, but I'm not sure there are going to be a lot of 400 night conference events in Europe in the near future. You know, we've seen a lot of our clients, for example, who have had very successful August sales, but September and October have dropped by 80%. Summer is gone and business travel has not returned and leisure travel from around the world has been limited. So the new normal is something that I think a lot of suppliers have yet to really grapple with and understand that to engage global travel is going to require a whole new way of thinking, acting and behaving. Thanks very much for sharing this time with us. I hope you found the presentation to be interesting. And here are my contact details. Feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions or comments or would like some more information from our side in China. Best regards to all and greetings from Shanghai.